Uh, so we have a, a good crowd where people usually come on as we go. Um, so I'm going to start. I want to welcome our regular guests. Uh, I also want to welcome Kaden, who's with us uh, from Armenia. Oh, I see Robin is with you too. Hello. Yeah, <laughs> he's great to be here. As an ophthalmologist, as an ophthalmologist eye surgeon, I have to say I love Robin's eyes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Very good. So I'm going to start uh, by just the weekly summary of what's happening. Uh, this is week 16. Uh, this also is a very interesting meeting because uh, we're going to be kicking off our Minion Engineering Week, which is July 6th through 10th. Uh, so exciting tonight. Uh, we're going to hear about the ventilator project. Uh, this is a Armenia's response to the shortage of ventilators throughout the world. And we're very proud of all their efforts, which are really uh, achieving uh, success, uh, even though many people doubted they can do such a project, but it's happening. Uh, they're making us believers. Uh, we also are gonna have Robin the robot. You saw Robin blinking at us just a few moments ago. Uh, this is revolutionary. Uh, Robin is one of many different kinds of robots that we are beginning to see uh, in our hospitals and in our nursing homes. And I have a feeling that this might be a way of the future. As we move forward, uh, we uh, here in the New York, New Jersey area are shell shock still. Uh, many of us know people that have died from COVID or had COVID, uh, but in other parts of the country, uh, they're just experiencing uh, the wrath of COVID. And it just is a reminder uh, that we cannot become complacent. Uh, even though you much would rather be sick today than on week one of the virus, oh. not much has changed. This virus is still throughout the world. It's still there and uh, it can cause havoc to our communities and our families. An interesting statistic is that it took 100 days to get the first million cases. And uh, what we're seeing is us reach another million cases faster and faster. Uh, it took only six days to go from 8 million to 9 million cases. Another way to look at what's happening is just look at the total number of cases. Again, uh, when we started these meetings 16 weeks ago, way back here, COVID was really something we were hearing about, uh, but not really prepared for, as we found out once it struck uh, very rapidly. Um, Europe seems to be relatively stable, but the bulk of the cases we see are in North America and a growing number in South America as Brazil and Chile uh, and Mexico uh, really have very bad disease. In fact, Brazil is now number two on the hit parade. Um, this just shows the deaths throughout the world um, and I think we much rather would be in Europe or in Africa and all of us would be love to be in New Zealand where they have zero cases, uh, much to their geographic isolation and strict uh, mitigation techniques. But here in America, we're not doing too well in North America, Central America, but better than Brazil. Um, the daily averages um, are increasing throughout the world. Uh, here is the United States. And it looks like we were on a steady trend down. And indeed, we hit the bottom on June 9th. We had about 20,000 cases. And yesterday, we spiked up to 39,000. So we basically doubled the daily incidence. Again, a uh, warning and maybe an indication of the lack of social distancing and other mitigation techniques during the Memorial Day holiday and the protests that have been going on. Uh, so it's a cautionary flag. Here's Armenia on the bottom. It does look flatline. Uh, but don't be deceived, it's just a small number of cases. When we first talked around March 12th, there were three, less than three cases. And today I believe there were 660 new cases. So uh, again, this is really ramping up there as well. And uh, we know there's been a lot of havoc to all of our organizations. Uh, this just shows globally uh, how many events have been canceled in the public uh, domain. Uh, so uh, clearly the things have slowed down quite a bit. Uh, we had some inter interesting news this week from the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, I particularly have an interest in this given that it's very hard to secure uh, N95 masks, which eye surgeons have been required to wear. Um, we have been getting them uh, and we're trying to afford them, but if there is a second wave, we won't have enough. Uh, this is an instant dot. Uh, you basically put a little water in there you put a metal rack, you put your mask inside of a paper bag, you steam it, 
for 30 minutes at 149 degrees and then let the bag dry out. So this is the newest recommendation from the Department of Homeland Security. It's a little trip, trick and yes, I did buy two of these Instant Pots. Um, wearing the mask is something that you know we are well ingrained with. We need to do it. Uh, the primary reason for doing it is so you don't uh, spread the infection to others. Intuitively, we feel that it protects us as well. And the CDC is doing research on this now and reading between the lines, they're getting confirmatory evidence, uh, evidence-based medicine that yes, that, is, that statement is indeed true as well. But more to hear about that. Um, looking forward, um, we started in the middle, the end of winter. And here we are now uh, in summer, officially, June 21st. Uh, what are we looking forward to? And we have the fall coming up. And the fall is the beginning of the flu season. Uh, this historically is a bad illness. Um, it's an illness that in 2017-18 season afflicted over 22 million people and almost 80,000 deaths. Uh, last year, the season affected 16.5 million people and 34,000 deaths. So this is nothing, sorry, to sneeze at, uh, but it is a cautionary flag because now we're entering the fall, not only with the flu season, but colliding with coronavirus. And there's something that's very important about the influenza virus, and that is it's responsive to the flu vaccine yet compliance of getting the flu vaccine is not where it should be. 40 or 50% of the population gets it on a year in year out basis. So I'm gonna stop for a moment. We have a lot of very bright people on the phone and more than when we started. And the question is, given the collision that's coming between the coronavirus and the flu season, given the uh, lack of penetrance of the vaccine, only 40-50% of the population does it. Should we as the clergy, as nonprofit organizations, uh, do something to increase awareness uh, in the Armenian population so that 40-50% number goes way up? So that's the question. And who wants to be the brave person to give the first response? So Larry, when you said 40-50%, to 50 were you referring to the general population or to the Armenians? And if so, the Armenians in Armenia or the Armenians elsewhere? Well, you raise a lot of good issues. That's a general number. I think if we asked about the healthcare population, uh, most of us are mandated to get it for hospital privileges. Uh, but the general mix is 40, 50% for US. I don't know, Sean maybe can share us the number in Armenia, but it, I think it's lower due to the ant, strong anti-vaxxer movement there. Uh, I don't wanna give too much um, credence to the anti-vaxxers in, in Armenia. They're not, they're vocal, um, but the childhood vaccination coverage rate in Armenia is impressively high. And um, I don't think that it's high for adults. There's not as much contact with the adult uh, out, out, outpatient um, system there, but um, but you know my my guess is that if this was a priority, um, that it could be something that could be done. Um, it's a matter of resources. And Shot, maybe you could address the um, question about healthcare professionals. And as Larry said, in the U.S., pretty much every healthcare professional is mandated. What about the um, policy in Armenia? I'm, I'm not aware of any such policy. I would venture to guess that nothing like that exists. Maybe Robin knows. <laughs> okay, so again, food for thought. Uh, the question is, should we, uh, as groups of nonprofits and leadership in the Armenian community, should we increase awareness and increase the rate of vaccination amongst the Armenian population? Uh, and uh, I'll leave it out there and we can always revisit that issue. And then the next question is, how do we go about it? But we can, that will be, we'll leave that to next week. Uh, maybe somebody can help us with that. Okay, so uh, that was the big question. Uh, in terms of what else has happened this week, um, we're seeing uh, a deep uh, fallout from coronavirus. The National Cancer Institute uh, calculated that uh, there's gonna be a 1% increase in mortality from GI cancer. 
uh, cancers of the stomach and intestines, uh, as well as from breast cancer, primarily because of interruption in care and lack of screening and changes in treatment protocols. Um, the digital fallout, uh, we see this in the educational realm where people don't have access to internet, particularly in developing countries like Peru. 45% of the population there doesn't have access, so the students are not getting the education that they need. Um, interestingly, there was an editorial in Nature magazine asking uh, all research being done on a corporate level, private level, governmental level to be put into an open source where everybody has access to it to uh, maximize the opportunities to come up with treatments and cures. Uh, it didn't meet with uh, a lot of positive comments. Um, the interesting development also is what's going on behind the scenes. As you know, there's over 100 vaccines in different stages of development. And on a global level, there's a lot of jockeying uh, to secure a vaccine for populations. So for example, AstraZeneca doesn't have a vaccine readily available yet. The United States and European Union each have secured 400 million doses of this. And the question comes up, how is the vaccine or vaccines when they're developed gonna be equitably distributed and what are small countries that don't have resources or political connections do? Uh, what's Armenia doing about this to secure the vaccine? Um, so that's something uh, that needs to be discussed. Um, very interesting. Uh, there was a report this week out of Wuhan that um, due to a sh an overwhelming need for people to be hospitalized and a lack of uh, physician resources, they utilized robots. Um, to do mundane things like cleaning the floors, delivering medicines, and monitoring patients. Uh, so it's very appropriate that Robin the Robot is visiting us with today, uh, so we can hear about that. But I'm also hearing about robots possibly used in nursing homes as companions. Uh, so the question is, uh, are we going to be seeing more robots in our future? Um, we are also very fortunate to have Dr. Kim Akimian, a prof assistant professor of nutrition, and Director of Educational Programs at Columbia School of uh, Medicine, the Vagilo School of Medicine. Uh, Kim, while we're waiting for Celine, uh, what can you tell us on a public health level of uh, this last week? Uh, well, I mean, interestingly enough, um, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Illinois are the four states that are doing the best in terms of case transmissions, but in large part because they're the states that also opened up um, the latest in this round, that the states of New York, the governors of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut have uh, jointly, uh, they put out a, a statement that, um, that requires people who come in from the states of Alabama, Arkansas, Arizona, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, Texas, Utah, and the state of Washington uh, to quarantine for 14 days when coming into these three states. And that's because, you know, they've done such a good job at mitigating. It's, you know, it's, it's very hard when people start traveling again to, uh, to keep those transmission rates low. Um, and did you want me to just put up the latest slides that Aras Chiloyan did from Armenia, or is that not? Uh, sure, let's hear it. Um, there's a group of um, public health um, uh, specialists, uh, Armenian Americans that are meeting um, weekly to look at data and Aras Chiloyan is from Boston and she has taken it upon herself to um, continually build out the um, data graphics per week. And so um, this is as of Monday, this is the latest graph. So the graph um, still shows an increasing incidence of total cases, which is normal. But I think that the good news here, so there's been almost 100,000 tests done of those, there have been 20,000 that have been um, positive since March 1st, and um, and then uh, re and then total number of recoveries. I actually think that number is low, and uh, 360 deaths. You know, I might be, I might, yeah, no, this is it. So, um, so the 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 graph I do want to show you here is two of them. One is that. Um, our Armenia made uh, wearing face masks, face masks mandatory here on the end of May. And um, as you know, the state of Texas has also recently mandated um, masks. Um, as you know, in the US, uh, mask wearing is um, state by state and county by county in some states decision. 
Um, uh -huh. And but no. yet it seems yeah, yeah. That at the at the outset. I mean, this really depends on the eligibility criteria of testing. But it would appear that um, sorry, I should make this larger. It would appear that there has been some plateauing of the positive test rate, uh, which is a good sign for Armenia. But again, this does depend in part on changes in eligibility criteria, um, which have changed over time. Uh, but I don't think they've changed that much in the last um, two weeks. And so this seems to be some sense that there is a plateauing. The red bars here are the positive cases. The yellow bars are the negative cases that were tested. So the bar graph as a whole shows a day-by-day -day, um, summary of the total tests that were taken and which percentage of those were positive and which percentage of those were, um, were negative. And um, the um, data that Aras has put together is from the Ministry of Health of Armenia's um, daily reporting on deaths. And so they only electronically report um, the sex and the age distribution of deaths. Um, and she is working on and will be presenting to our group this weekend on the data that she's trying to get from Artsakh so that we can see that and do some kind of comparisons as well. So that's that for this week. Any questions? You um, confirm, I think you're, in terms of deaths, there seem to be more men. Um, initially in Armenia, as I recall, at, certainly at the um, Grigor Lusunovorich Hospital, there were more hospitalized women, which was unusual. And has that borne out or is, it, is Armenia more representative of the rest of the world, namely with more men than women being affected by the disease? So this small pie piece, um, John, are the missing data points on this. We're trying to get, Aras is trying to get those with Vahe Khachadurian. Um, but even if those all are women, it would show that there are more, that deaths are more prevalent among men. And that's also true, in, you know, internationally and here in the United States. Um, the issue with looking at hospitalization rates that is not a proxy measure that we're currently looking at um, for two reasons. One is that up until May 22nd, all positive cases, whether they were mild or moderate or severe, were within the hospital monitoring system. In other words, if you were a positive, if you received a positive test, then you were brought into a system of monitoring, whether it was at the, ho at the hotel level or eventually if, you're, if your symptoms were severe enough, you would go into the hospital. So there would have been a hundred percent, so to speak, hospitalization rate until the um, until the 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 twenty second, and we don't have that differentiated by clinical stage. I mean, we actually could think about it by clinical stage that there was re that was reported on a day by day basis. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that now, post May twenty second, we may be able to utilize hospitalization. Um, data numbers as a daily um, tracking mechanism as we did here in New York and New Jersey um, as well. So I think it's a good, um, a good idea. I don't think the data is available to us in a way that we can look at it by sex in hospitalization, but rather just by total hospitalizations. But it's a good question and I'll pass that along. Kim, can you give us any idea about ICU capacity and utilization of ICUs in Armenia? So I'm going to actually ask Sean to answer that because I think that he's been following that. There's definitely a lot of press on it, but I'm, I'm going to ask Sean to um, reflect what he knows about the capacity building that they're doing because they have surpassed their original capacity that they put together for this um, at the infectious disease hospital and with the modular um, hospital that they built right next to it. Uh, so yeah, so as Kim was saying, the um, there is an effort to ramp up ICU capacity in the country and uh, for the first time, that also includes areas outside of Yerevan. So there are a few district hospitals or hospitals in the Marzis that uh, ICU capacity is being developed in. And that's uh, largely been made possible by the acquisition of um, oxygen concentrators and ventilator machines that allow for, um, for this uh, upscaling of all of this. The initial group of French physicians 
that arrived to Armenia about a week and a half to two, two weeks ago, their main task was to actually get one of the bigger uh, secondary ICUs in Yerevan up and running. Uh, and I believe that team uh, of French physicians has already returned with their uh, mission being successful. Of note, the Minister of Health this morning during his uh, uh, briefing said that the number of ICU patients has actually stabilized and we actually have um, a fair amount or reasonable capacity to, um, to accept uh, an additional surge of patients if necessary. Hopefully that won't be the case. That's great news. Um, and you did allude to the French team. For those that you're not aware of, there was a call for material goods to Armenia that Ambassador Nasession has been working tirelessly on with his team, uh, as well as uh, Greg uh, from Armenia Fund. Uh, there was also a call for physicians and, and nurses, healthcare providers, um, and the French now have sent uh, two teams. The second team arrived today or yesterday. Uh, there was a medical team from Moscow and a medical team from Lithuania, possibly others. Uh, the Armenia Fund uh, and APO, the Armenian American Health Professionals Organization, are exploring the idea of setting up a medical mission team from the United States. Um, so if you know of anyone who's interested in going, uh, please contact either Greg or myself at info at oppo.org. Uh, there's a myriad of questions that people will uh, rightfully have about going to Armenia uh, and there's transportation issues, but the transportation and um, the um, housing uh, will be covered as well as a small daily stipend. Uh, there's uh, ideas exploring that it might be more feasible for people from Europe and from the Middle East, uh, like Beirut, to go since it's a closer distance and the stipend is lucrative to the people in Beirut at this unfortunate time for them. Uh, but we are working on this. Uh, it, nothing is definite. Um, but if you know of anyone, please contact us. But it's really amazing how many people have responded with ideas for meetings like this. And I really want to thank Dr. Sh uh, Sherkadimian, um, who is a pediatric surgeon at the UCLA Mattel uh, Children's Hospital and uh, teaches at UCLA as well. Um, he had mentioned something about some person named Robin. I had no idea what he was babbling about uh, 10 weeks ago, but he says, Larry, when time's right, I'm gonna introduce Robin to all of you. Um, and uh, tonight is the night. Uh, Shant, uh, can you uh, uh, introduce us to your wonderful team? I think we have Justin with us and Kaden. Uh, so thank you for introducing everybody and, and conducting this portion of the meeting. Thanks, Larry. Um, so I'm also very excited for all of you guys to get to see uh, Robin and to learn about uh, everything that uh, it does because it is very, very unique and very innovative and I think will uh, change uh, the landscape uh, in the hospital setting and beyond for many patients and people alike. So um, I was, as you were talking, I was trying to remember how I met Gauden. Um, I think it was a very standard Armenian connection, a friend of a friend of a friend who somehow told me about this. And all of a sudden we ended up at a Starbucks in Glendale and um, he gave me the spiel. Uh, and in five minutes, I really saw the value of this. And of course it was icing on the cake that we would be supporting a, an initiative that is completely, completely uh, thought of, designed, developed, and is being constantly improved in, uh, in Armenia. So um, we were lucky enough to have uh, gotten uh, uh, sort of uh, rely on us to do some of the academic work at UCLA. Um, and that's where my colleague, uh, fellow pediatric surgeon, Justin Wagner has uh, also come into play and has joined the group. He's uh, leading the research uh, so that we can uh, demonstrate, well, for, well, actually confirm a lot of the findings that have already been demonstrated uh, in Armenia, but do it on a larger scale and do it in our uh, U.S. setting over here. So Justin, uh, I think we'll give a few words about some of the research we're conducting. But we were, um, as you also alluded to, um, uh, Robin was caught up in uh, travel bans as well, and it took a little longer for him to get here 
So not him or her for it to get here. Um, uh, but we uh, finally had him and he has been, uh, sorry, he, she, it has been <laughs> browsing the halls of the uh, UCLA Children's Hospital, really making everyone turn around and take a second look. Um, so, but without further ado, let me turn it over to Garen, who is the CEO of Exper uh, Technologies uh, that is behind Robin. Uh, to tell you the story, and then we'll uh, transition over to Justin. Great, thank you, Shant. Uh, first of all, I'm humbled to be here and to present and tell this story about Robin and our company. Thank you for having, having us today. I want to start uh, by meeting with Robin. Uh, hey, Robin. Hi, Mom. How are you? You are sleepy. It's okay. You will sleep soon. Can you introduce okay. yourself? Yes. I am Robin, a friendly companion robot. I am seven years old and I live in hospitals. I love to make new friends and play lots of games with them. That's great. Robin, do you have a dream? Yes. I want to fly to space. Oh, that's great. Do you have a dream? Yes, I have. Uh, my dream is to see you in on all hospitals. Do you want to see my magic trick? Yes, please. Look at my eyes. Oh, amazing. <laughs> Great, Robin. Thank you. You can sleep now. Okay. Good night. So it was Robin. Uh, and I want to start my presentation uh, from a short video from our pilot at Wigmore Clinic. Uh, here is it. During hospitalization, children do need uh, several investigations and interventions, and some of them, unfortunately, are really painful. This makes children to be under the stress, uh, to feel lonely. So we were looking for innovative solution, and we found Robin. Chors botkuni, bite shunchi, zueatsun, tchunchi. For the first month of using Robin, we already saw an increase in patient satisfaction and we made a decision to continue our work with Robin. Robin managed to engage children and medical staff in a cooperative environment. It allowed us to provide a better experience to our patients and their families. So that was a video from our pilot, uh, and I want to start my presentation. So children who undergo so children with chronic conditions undergo challenging and stressful experience in medical settings. They are being exposed to a variety of negative factors such as painful procedures, isolation, uh, and, uh, high level of stress, and all of these factors affect their medical treatment and health outcomes. So the, most of the hospitals try to provide social and emotional support to the hospitalized children, but unfortunately, big gaps exist between human resource supply and demand. And during time of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, children are much more isolated because visitations have been strictly limited in the hospitals and there are less interactions with children to minimize the risk of uh, spreading, spreading the virus. And especially now, there is a big need for providing companionship to children. And we have solution. It is Robin. 
Robin is an adorable body who is always there to help and support during challenging times. Robin is a companion robot with the sole purpose to make children happier during their medical treatments. Robin engages children in playful and meaningful interactions. Robin tells stories, jokes, play interactive games with children, and uh, also explains the uh, complicated, sometimes scary procedures in very simple way. We're building emotional intelligence technology, and thanks to it, Robin can build peer-to-peer -peer interactions with children, and this way uh, help to overcome stress and anxiety. And during the pandemic, Robin provides an opportunity for the hospitals to, for providing social and emotional support to children without any direct human contact. So here you can see how children react to Robin. So our technology allows Robin to build peer-to-peer -peer interactions uh, with children. Robin analyzes facial expressions, emotions, context of the conversations, se extracting sentiments from, from the conversations. And this way changes his behavior uh, we're doing this to make more most natural experience uh, while interacting with children. The other technological innovation is that Robin can remember conversations with children. So Robin rem remembers uh, features of partic particular kid and can bring up uh, in a follow-up dialogues. So it is actually how we do. We remember uh, uh, what we were speak, uh, spoken before and this way the conversation become natural. Uh, yeah. So existing uh, therapy robots or companion robots that are used in hospitals are more toys rather than peers. There are no uh, meaningful interactions and their lack of uh, conversations. They're used as a toys, uh, as a distraction tools, but we built Robin in that way that it behaves as an actual kid in the hospitals. So it, Robin asks questions, uh, he uh, loves to learn new things, he loves to uh, play with kids. So this way we're creating a peer for, for children at hospitals. So we did a study in year one uh, in Wigmore Clinic and North Marash Medical Center. Uh, the pilot, the study involved uh, 120 children, uh, the age group for, from four to 12 year, years old. Uh, it took 12 uh, weeks. Uh, so we tested Robin in both inpatient and outpatient settings. Uh, 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 and, um, so we used, uh, we were collecting data like behavioral data, energy level, amount of crying, screaming, observational data, procedural data like time of preparation for the procedures, amount of drug, drugs used. Also, we were uh, measuring stress level and also uh, pain level of children. So pilot showed that uh, thanks to Robin, it was, it was, uh, we were able to increase joyfulness level by more than 26%, as well as uh, we were able to reduce stress by 40, 34%. In some cases, Robin uh, was able to reduce preparation for the procedures, time of the preparation for the procedures up to 40% because children were less stressed and more cooperative with doctors. So we also conducted phone survey uh, to the patients who, who were visiting hospital during the uh, period of the pilot. So we conducted survey to 424 uh, visitors and uh, survey showed that the people, uh, 
the visitors, those who interacted with Robin has higher satisfaction with the clinic's uh, services by 14.4%. And 100% of those who interacted with Robin wants to meet him again. So as Sean mentioned, we're uh, starting exciting uh, study at UCLA. And uh, I want to ask Justin or Sean to uh, provide more details on this. Justin, do you want to give a quick summary of our study? My pleasure. So firstly, uh, let me just express my appreciation for the opportunity to speak in this, uh, in this group. Um, we were excited to hear about Robin even before COVID broke out. And, um, you know, it started out with just a conversation between God and, and Shant and me. We found enormous value in the robot. Once uh, the isolation uh, came into play, then we really thought this was a no-brainer and put the foot on the accelerator to get a study team together. Um, we will not just be uh, replicating the results seen at Wigmore Clinic, we'll also be sort of delving a little bit more into the qualitative aspects of how the patients and our families interact with the robot and feel about the interaction in the first place. So we've enlisted the help of some behavioral health specialists who have designed a, an instrument of, of um, interview and a qualitative analysis that will take place. We'll also be talking to nurses about their experience with the robot and with their, uh, their patients before and after their interactions. Was it easier to um, care for those patients, change out IVs, uh, adjust pump settings? Um, and then on top of that, we have uh, child life specialists that are really going to be the uh, engines behind all of this. Uh, they usually provide services of distraction and therapy in various forms for patients in the hospital. Um, and uh, under these circumstances, they'll have a laptop that's going to be connected to Robin and will be conducting a telepresence uh, using Robin as an avatar for them. So uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to use Robin to its fullest extent of, of automation and uh, artificial intelligence. Right now, we're going to be restricting to just a telepresence that's going to convey um, a voice and uh, changes in avatar expressions from our child life specialists. But based on that, those data that we generate, I think that we'll be able to sort of propel into the future the ability of Robin to interact on a much more autonomous basis. Uh, and would also give us just an incredible insights into the way that uh, children will interact with, with a robot and what we can do for patients, not just in a resource rich setting like UCLA, but also in more resource limited settings and in, in remote settings. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Uh, I'll just add, I think Godin has a couple of other slides, but um, we're just very excited about the technology, but also the, the data that can be collected from a, a machine that is able to analyze emotion, the, the, the whole idea of emotional intelligence. And I think all of us on the group really believe that um, the inpatient pediatric population is just, a, uh, is just an entry point and the, um, the future is limitless. And I think the applications outside of the hospital setting in the geriatric population and the educational sector uh, are all there. And uh, uh, we just saw the pediatric inpatient population as, an, as a natural fit for an entry point, but uh, certainly the vision is there for uh, work way beyond uh, what we're imagining right now. Uh, Darren? I have two short questions. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I think Godin just had you, you. Should we have Godin finish the presentation real quick? Or oh, okay. you, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Justin Shant. Uh, so, so so far we developed MVP of Robin. Uh, we're collaborating with Bigmore Clinic, uh, North Marash Medical Center, Avanta Dental Clinic groups. Uh, in year one. Uh, we also started collaboration with UNDP, 
And thanks to this collaboration, uh, we're planning to deploy Robin in all public hospitals in Armenia, pediatric hospitals in Armenia. We're also deploying Robin uh, at ABC Kids Dental Group in LA on July 1st. And uh, also that uh, study that we're going to do uh, at UCLA Mattel Children's Hospital. So we have big interest from international media and here are the uh, journals that featured Robin, already featured Robin. And we're getting uh, uh, more and more requests from the media in US and uh, other medias. So Robin also uh, became the product of the day, week and month, on the famous product hunt platform. So our team uh, combines deep expertise in machine learning, uh, engineering, occupational therapy, uh, psychology. Our team is consist of 13 people and uh, we have engineers, software engineers, uh, psychologists in our team. So our company raised the initial fundraising round uh, last week. So we were baked by SmartGate VC, High Ventures, and the other angel investors. So currently we're starting three million seed round uh, for a runway for 18 months to develop the fully autonomous version of Robin and already have the ready for mass production uh, version. So we're expecting to have 100K monthly recurring revenue at that point. So uh, this was Robin. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Robin, uh, thank you very much. And thank you. I, I know it's, it was 5 a.m. when this call started. Yeah. <laughs> so we really, really appreciate. But I think that also speaks to the experience that we've had working with Godin and the team in Armenia. Uh, not only is the technology exciting, but uh, working with uh, the caliber of folks that we have been working uh, with in Armenia, uh, Godin and his team has just been incredible, an incredible experience. And so um, without taking too much more of your time, Larry, do we have time to field a couple of questions for Godin? Absolutely. Uh, Karen, I have uh, two short questions. Uh, one of them is uh, Robin. Does Robin uh, have a uh, face recognition? And the other one, mm -hmm. does he speak to the, uh, besides Armenian and English, does he speak different languages? Mm -hmm. Yes, so Robin has a facial recognition system, but that features that feature we are uh, going to discuss with the hospitals and their privacy policy according to their privacy policies but yes we have that feature so we can use that uh, uh, regarding uh, the the language skills so currently we're focused on the english and the technology works the best uh, on english because the the models that we're using uh, are well trained for English language, but uh, we are considering uh, for advancement of the technology to add also Spanish language because of the population, uh, Spanish uh, speaking population in the US. Yeah, but in the future we can add also uh, different kind of languages. Garen, uh, unfortunately, uh, children do have chronic diseases and they require multiple hospitalizations over a large amount of time. Does Robin download the data to a central data bank so when the child is recognized through your recognition technologies, it, any robot could then pull that data up or is it one robot per child and you always have to make sure that that child gets the same robot? So Robin has a mobility platform so it can uh, move in a hospital and visit multiple patients. So uh, they are, we are, uh, we're expecting to have Robin in each department uh, in a hospital. 
pediatric departments. So uh, Robin can recognize children and uh, store the interactions data uh, in its memory. So it's possible to uh, uh, recognize children during the next hospitalization and uh, build follow-up dialogues. Uh, and the idea is exactly that. So we're Robin builds a relationship with kids. So if I will explain like uh, Robin, like uh, speak about Robin. So Robin is a kid who lives in a hospital and love making friends. So we're creating uh, a peer interactions and the remembering the interactions and features of a child is very important for that. How many of those Robins you have now available? Uh, right now we have uh, five robots, uh, two of them uh, in, U in, in LA. Uh, so we are uh, improving our manufacturing uh, capabilities. So currently we can manufacture three robots in a month. Where? So in Armenia, we. Oh. We we do manufacturing in Armenia and exporting from here today. Wonderful. Yeah. I have a question as well um, for Garden and maybe for Justin as well. Um, could you describe briefly what are some of the um, barriers or the challenges of integrating this into your um, into your hospital staff and the floors? What any any resistance from any sectors of the um, healthcare providers on the floors? Sure, I can speak to that a bit. We um, we really had no uh, no barriers from the standpoint of the providers. Uh, we actually have got a, a lot of excitement, enthusiasm about bringing Robin to our children. Um, a little trepidation on the parts of the infectious disease and and um, prevention experts, uh, mostly for the sake of protocolizing the robots so that when we deliver from room to room, we're not a transmission risk. Um, but that said, they are also very excited at the prospect of a surrogate going from room to room rather than having more human beings going from room to room. Um, aside from that, most of them are clerical or administrative logistical issues like information security protections um, and otherwise. Those, uh, you know, they're, they're hurdles to go through, but I think that they're not really going to provide much more of a delay than a few weeks just to be able to smooth those over. In analyzing uh, the patient's emotions, uh, does it also look for other vital signs? And does it have the ability to a medical issue that needs prompt attention? So uh, currently, Robin uh, analyzing emotions to uh, respond naturally during the interactions. But uh, by the advancement of the technology, we can have that uh, ability as well. So I just wanted to add uh, something on your question. So uh, as Shant mentioned, we are not looking only on pediatric uh, population. So it is an, uh, the entry point for us. So in the future, we are we we see Robin being used also for elderly population, and uh, and there just imagine Robin uh, reminding the elderly population, uh, elderly like uh, take pills, reminding do yoga or some physical activities, and also providing that feeling of companionship and uh, solving the loneliness and isolation problems. So in that case, I think uh, the idea of analyzing emotions uh, for some predictions of some kind of mental issues or some kind of uh, risks, so it will be very great to have and uh, we will consider that. Do you have any competition in this area? I know there's another robot that roams around called uh, Buddy. 
Have you heard of it? Yeah. Uh, I met with their founder in Paris. Uh, there, it is a small robot, uh, also with facial expressions, but uh, it, is, uh, it is used uh, for, uh, it's kind of a home assistant for uh, kids. It's not only for kids, like uh, just Alexa, but more emotional and uh, can move around. So in technological point of view, uh, they, they, they don't do something new. They're using some kind of dialogue system that you are pre-programming the questions and answers, but and uh, robot can answer to the, those questions, but uh, we're doing completely different thing. And uh, we are, so during the pilot in Armenia and upcoming deployments in US, uh, we're planning to, so we're collecting data on how dialogues are being uh, structured uh, to, between R Robin and the child. So, and we already collected 200 uh, plus hours of data. So based on that data, Robin learns the style of conversation. So we're not pre-programming the questions. Robin learns how to speak with children based on the collected data. So this is completely new approach, which haven't done before. Have you reached your uh, fundraising target? Uh, so we closed the pre previous uh, uh, round. So we just started raising the new round, uh, three million seed round, and uh, we have uh, good traction in the meaning of investors and uh, all the media publicity and uh, helps for the process. You know, I'm thinking about those meaningful interactions that Robin is having with the children. How do you see, especially with emotional intelligence, with people that have a cognitive impairment and then they, have, they may have some manifest, some behavioral problem. How do you see for the, do you see Robin maybe in a pilot study or like I've been recently um, interfacing with uh, the Ministry of Health, uh, actually, uh, I'm sorry, social labor in Armenia about the Nork Old Age Home and how the older people are very isolated. Robin would be instrumental in, you know, bridging that gap, especially during the COVID times too. I'm wondering, do you, do you, how do you see this, uh, you know, the evolution mm -hmm. of advancing toward working with older people with dementia. Mm -hmm. So uh, I definitely see Robin uh, in that domain and uh, the only, on, so even we were reached out from the elderly house from, from LA for the deployment there. Uh, I mean, uh, so we see and when we were starting, it was, uh, one of our ideas to also deploy there. Uh, and so currently, uh, so we, the problem that we can do many things in the same time is because of the resor resources and the focus. But uh, after the raising the, the round, uh, the seed round, uh, we can definitely start try and test new things. So uh, the, quite, the answer is yes, like we're uh, considering that and we're planning to do that. That's awesome because it really serves a, you know, the geriatric population, this can be a very important, um, yeah, meaningful interaction of Robin, um, that consistency, um, is going to is very important for them treatment wise you know um reducing reducing their stress reducing um their behavioral problems i can see that very much so Gaudi and i have a question uh, 
how much manpower is required uh, with the robot on the floor? I know you have a team of researchers at UCLA, but the day-to-day -day operation, uh, how many individuals are necessary to um, maintain um, Robin and um, get Robin to the places it needs to be? Um, uh, Robin is uh, uh, around uh, 20 kilograms, uh, and but it moves, can move around. So it uses battery and can be remotely controlled uh, when you want to move, when the, uh, it should be moved to the another room or some, uh, some places. So uh, a person, even not located in that actual hospital or setting, can easily move Robin around. So it's, uh, it doesn't require too much resources for doing that. Right now um, at UCLA, we have someone escorting Robin to make sure that it is safe and uh, the self-driving sort of feature is is working well. Um, and then on the back side, on a laptop, is sitting a child life specialist or a child psychologist who is actually interacting with the patient remotely. But this is during the process of Robin quote unquote learning and that we anticipate will happen for the next 12 to 18 months. Once Robin has, has learned and can interact uh, autonomously, then, and we've uh, uh, assured that the movement can also be done uh, safely, then it could, virtu you know, it could virtually be fully autonomous and not require any background people. Karen, we have a question. Of all the names, why Robin? <laughs> it's a very interesting question. So, um, so when we were naming, actually it's not our first robot. We had another robot uh, when we just starting and the name was Charlie and uh, we're so uh, our idea was to having the name some kind of emotional name friendly name and also with many associations we like name Robin because also it uh, doesn't it is gender neutral name so we don't want to give it human, uh, m m like many human features. We are more creating a, a unique creatures. So that's why we called uh, a robot Robin. This is very, very exciting. Um, are there any other questions for Justin, uh, Tadden and Shant? Or Robin. We want to say good night to Robin. <laughs> Robin is already sleeping. <laughs> or you need to wake him up or her up or it. <laughs> uh, thanks again, Justin, for uh, taking away time from your family and got in for staying up or waking up early, whichever you chose to do. But <laughs> appreciate it. Yeah, we all Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you so much. And we're so proud of you being Armenian and developing this. And thanks for all the studies at UCLA. Uh, Sean, when do you feel the studies will be over uh, that you can report back some data? Uh, Justin can chime in, but we already have IRB approval right now. The child life specialists are going through a week of uh, sort of practicing and training, and then um, we'll maybe spend another uh, week or so to to do a or one to two weeks to do a dry run, and then and then jump right into the data collection phase. Um, Justin, is that timeline about right? I mean, I think we, we will have the data uh, st data collection starting within a month and hopefully complete it within a three month period. I think that's about what, right. And we sure would like to target this, uh, this wave of coronavirus to really kind of be the impetus for our data collection. Um, but it is kind of dependent on um, the patient census and who's an appropriate, appropriate patient for the study. Um, but yes, three months is, uh, I think, a reasonable time. Okay. Um, so if there's no other questions, again, we want to thank uh, the whole team. Uh, it's
terrific and uh, we're great. Um, if there's no other questions, uh, we're going to start talking about uh, another development from Armenia, and that's the ventilator project. Um, as you know, COVID-19 uh, caused considerable stress on many different healthcare systems. Uh, in America, uh, here in New York, uh, there was the call for thousands and thousands of ventilators, which didn't exist. Uh, fortunately, uh, they ultimately were not needed, and America did uh, build up its capacity uh, through a number of corporate public uh, partnerships. Um, Armenia also, uh, at that time, and in that environment when there was this concern, there was not enough respirators in the world to go around, uh, stepped up and a group of engineers had this idea that they would build their own ventilators. And uh, I was uh, very um, fortunate to have been included on some of the initial calls with Shant and Mr. John Martiroshian, who's on the phone as well. Um, didn't really know what to expect. But I am so uh, happy uh, to announce that the project is moving along uh, splendidly. Uh, it's been granted some licenses and uh, winning some competitions. And we have two representatives of this project here with us tonight, um, who I would invite to speak in just a moment. We have Vegan Hovanissian, as well as Marina uh, Sagavinian. Um, so uh, Marina, uh, would you like to start? and explain a little bit about the ventilator project, its history, and where you are? Uh, yes, good morning or good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? You're perfect. Uh, wonderful. Um, yeah, this was a very um, exciting time. Uh, we actually uh, started with uh, a call to action, as did every other company around the globe, basically, uh, for uh, ventilators and breathing devices. Uh, so I'm representing the Engineering Association in Armenia, and this call came from uh, the Armenian Ministry of High Tech uh, for the design and manufacturing of ventilators. And um, immediately, of course, a focus team of engineers, including biomedical, electrical, mechanical, uh, all got together to figure out what needs to be done. I mean, again, this was at a national level, so urgency was of utmost importance. Uh, and we uh, started to reach out uh, to the medical community because this was a ventilator. So uh, engineers needed some uh, more data as far as, okay, how, what, what needs to be part of this ventilator? What is, what is the most urgent? What is the need? What is the demand? Uh, so that, that's how we started. Uh, that was the journey that we started. Uh, and at the same time, um, we were looking around uh, at the existing supply of ventilators in Armenia, uh, especially if, uh, starting from Yerevan, and trying to figure out the ones that are in storage, the ones that are not work working, and uh, let's start repairing. So immediately that initiative also took place in parallel, and, uh, um, I, and we got an immediate result of uh, 12 ventilators were starting to work based on that initiative by itself. Uh, so that was, uh, that was one uh, uh, part of the journey. Uh, at the same time, because of this initiative from the government, uh, there was a, uh, the, a, a grant competition that took place. Uh, the, and the grant competition was uh, within the framework of the decision of government of Republic of Armenia. Uh, and it was uh, given to the Engineering Association to uh, uh, coordinate this competition among uh, all the, uh, of course, the candidates that uh, stepped forward. Uh, and we were happy to announce that um, one of the companies and the candidates, which is YA Engineering, uh, which was part of the whole engineering team as well, uh, they had done a lot of research in the beginning, uh, uh, they, uh, they, they came in, they uh, provided their proposal, uh, and they were selected as being uh, the, uh, the, the, the company that would take this forward. So we were very happy for that. Uh, so I have online with us um, Vigen, who is uh, part of this team. And I think Vigen is driving the slide, so I'll, I'll ask Vigen to, um, uh, can you go to the next slide?
So uh, why engineering? I just want to give a quick introduction. Uh, why engineering uh, provides solutions and services from design to manufacturing uh, and partners very closely with its customers uh, uh, in all stages of development. So basically, uh, the strength of this company is the fact that it is uh, there is already there was already a process, ongoing process of. Uh, working towards the end goal uh, from uh, from design uh, to development and making sure that uh, it accelerated the end result uh, by working very closely with its customers and uh, its experience in the different industries uh, whether it's automotive uh, wireless communication semiconductor RF devices uh, of course, uh, all, all this experience with working with complex, uh, um, uh, complex issues helps to help them with this, uh, trying to come up with a solution for uh, ventilators. Uh, their experience, again, with regards to multidisciplinary and their, uh, their, uh, their rich, rich background, uh, was one of the thing, really things that were pretty, probably impressed everybody. Uh, and as you can see here, it's a, there's a rich lineup of expertise uh, that, uh, that it, first of all, as a result of their experience in different applications within the different industries. So it's, very, it's a company that was, is very process driven uh, and it, it helped a lot with their uh, with the next steps. And some of the solutions that we had seen basically was, uh, there is of course the, uh, this is the ADAS closed loop HIL system uh, and the industrial IoT research platforms. All these are very complex solutions and building a ventilator and the human body and all that requires a lot of this type of analysis. So basically uh, uh, from, a, from an introduction to this company and uh, their, uh, capabilities, uh, their manufacturing capabilities was there, uh, and their um, flexibility and their basically the whole uh, package was very impressive. So I'd like to pass it on now to uh, Vigen for him. To Good evening, everyone. So uh, thank you, Marina, for introduction. Uh, so I'm representing this uh, this company for which has a full chain from the design to manufacturing, why engineering. So uh, I will talk about um, talk about the ventilator project that at uh, the beginning it was just a pure initiative and then it was converted into a, like a, a real something that will um, uh, that that uh, we hope that it will be manufactured in Armenia proudly manufactured in Armenia. So everything started from the call for action uh, when when uh, Minister of the High Tech just uh, uh, called everyone, uh, everybody, all the engineering companies to develop uh, some to develop and quickly provide some some ventilator. And you know, like during this COVID situation, pandemic, like ventilators, uh, there's a shortage of the ventilators. So uh, our engineers like uh, started immediately to, to review everything that like we are not a medical company. Um, we are not a medical company. We we didn't like uh, um, uh, we had developed some some uh, few uh, let's say medical accessories. I think in the past, but I mean it, it, we are not a medical company. But we started, but we are an engineering company. We started to uh, review all the open source uh, materials that were uh, available uh, in the in the internet so um and then started to assess each of them so uh, we included uh, um, a, a different specialists uh, um, both from 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 uh, like uh, uh, from armenia outside and they were discussing this with uh, isa armenian engineering um, Engineers and Scientists Association. So, um, and um, it, it was a huge contribution by them also. Uh, and uh, so we understood that um, 
like open source, some, some sort of open source uh, ventilators cannot be used. Like we're talking with the doctors and doctor said, no, I'm not going to connect this to my patient. So this, this is going to kill him after, after two hours. So I don't want to um, like uh, have, have this kind of ventilator, even if this is, has been, I mean, uh, developed by MIT. So I don't care about MIT. I care about my, my patient. So I'm not going this, to connect this to, 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 my, to my patient. And, and then we understood the, the, the uh, what is the, uh, what, what, what challenge we face, what, what, what kind of issues we can face there. So even like uh, we did some demonstrator kit to understand uh, like uh, uh, starting from the supply chain ending up with like mechanical and engineering, uh, uh, what, what gaps do we face with medical equipment? And uh, so we uh, started to discuss uh, with, uh, with, uh, with different specialists um, and uh, like uh, some of, I, I, saw, I saw some of, uh, some of them in, in, in this meeting. Uh, so we uh, engaged uh, anesthesiologists, pulmonary specialists, uh, like uh, and biomedical engineers, and we divided into different stages, everything to started uh, like um, uh, product definition, design, supply chain, uh, uh, validation of the product. Then we started to, to, uh, to fill out in this table the names, uh, expertise, uh, companies, where they can help, how they can help in, in which stage. Um, and... Uh, and started to to design our uh, let's say our uh, uh, vent ventilator minimum viable ventilator what what is needed for the covid nineteen patients and um, um, so we we uh, we got this uh, two documents uh, one is from the fda Another one is the equivalent organization from the UK, uh, which is, uh, and they are defining what is a minimum viable ventilator for the COVID-19, specifically for COVID-19. But this was, uh, we, again, we didn't took this as a, uh, we, uh, like this was a guiding documents for us, but we uh, rely on uh, doctors because our, uh, <clears throat> let's say, and customers, final customers are the doctors. So they, they need to decide. So they need to decide if they will connect this to the patient or not. Uh, so we uh, did a lots of, so, so we started with the technical requirements. Uh, we uh, drafted the spec, we polished, uh, we make it uh, um, more, um, uh, let's say uh, detailed technical requirements list, um, and then uh, so we uh, again our uh, um, target was uh, after discussion uh, discussing with the doctors. So we understood where uh, where where is a gap that we need to cover, like uh, so if 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 you see this uh, graph the. X axis is the axis uh, how heavy the patient situation is. Uh, so here is uh, without any symptoms. Sorry, part of this is in, our, in Armenian, part of in English. Like uh, uh, th this part of is without symptoms, and here is very heavy uh, patients. Um, and uh, um, According to our discussions with the uh, doctors, um, here here they will prefer to connect what is already like uh, um, like off the uh, off the shelf like fully functional ventilators, but there is a huge gap uh, like there is a shortage of the ventilators which needs to be connected here for the patients who are not in a heavy stage 
but they need some assistance, breathing assistance. So according to this, like the technical requirements has been polished. And then, um, uh, so we, we propose so engineering association, as Marina mentioned, so engineering association, um, so uh, organized uh, funding, funding program, uh, organized like uh, funding program, um, which it was uh, initially uh, announced by the Ministry of High Tech. So it was a competition, let's say, uh, it's, it's, it's not a right word, a competition in this situation because this is like a, a call for action to whole nation. So, but it was uh, co companies uh, applied to this, uh, different companies applied to, um, uh, to this funding and uh, with the request and the, the working committee uh, which has been uh, consisted of the doctors representative from the uh, representative from from the uh, minister of health minister of high tech um, by, by biomedical engineers different research institutions uh, so, so they selected our proposal, and uh, so uh, um, we. Um, so now we have already uh, started to work on this. Uh, so we engaged the uh, National Polytechnic University of Armenia, called like a Polytechnic. We call it Polytechnic, and also like the Institute of. Philo uh, uh, physiology, uh, which is under the National Academy of Sciences umbrella, um, so uh, to to develop uh, to develop the, some algor algorithms, so to re leverage what what is already there. Um, well, and this is it, and. Um, uh, this is we are trying to make it. Uh, while where the purpose, while it is targeted to uh, uh, COVID-19 patients with minimum viable ventilator features for COVID-19, we are trying to make it everything closer to the off-the-shelf ventilators because, like the doctors, uh, pulmonarists, like uh, anesthesiologists, they they use uh, whatever is. Uh, like they used to work with off-the-shelf ventilators means like the even the bottom where it is even the uh, indicators even the uh, like um, measuring system uh, even like uh, alarming system everything needs to be closer to the ventilators because there is no time the doctors will not learn how to deal with the uh, with the new ventilators, new type of ventilators? So it should be a closer to uh, to existing ventilators by its functionality, even the alarming system, everything. Uh, and uh, so we are on a stage of uh, securing the supply chain. Uh, so we are in contact with all the suppliers um, in, in this list and uh, understanding. Um, the, the initial cost supply chain, uh, even we are in a contact with the uh, local, uh, local logistics company, which will, uh, and, uh, and we're in negotiations to shorten the, the times of uh, uh, component uh, supply because it's, it's not a one or two times we'll need the components. Uh, uh, we envision we understand that it will be continuously will need uh, some uh, some components till the end of the development um, well and also like we think also in parallel we think there is not a group of people engineers are um, the biomedical engineers and doctors are working on uh, uh, will be working on a testing of the ventilator uh, so um, so we are going to order this 
order or rent, depending on a price. So order or rent, like uh, this uh, testing systems, which is uh, one is a lung simulator uh, to uh, validate uh, the ventilator. And the other one is a gas flow analyzer, very precise, which is, uh, which is in uh, which is uh, for for this kind of application to, to test the ventilators. So we have uh, various, as I mentioned, resources uh, from project managers, systems engineers, uh, hardware in electronics, uh, mechanical engineers, uh, software engineers. Uh, and manufacturing engineers. And this is uh, like even the manufacturing expert, even our, uh, like our, uh, let's say, uh, end results will be just five pieces of the, uh, like, like at, at this stage, again, at this stage, we'll give just five pieces of the ventilators to test in the hospitals. So we uh, uh, we add the manufacturing expert in the first, even the design stages, so he could tell us if this is manufacturable or not for mass production or not. Uh, and uh, this is our process. Uh, basically, we have defined like 26 weeks, uh, six months of process. Uh, so. Uh, starting from the, from the design up to manufacturing, um, and uh, uh, as I mentioned, we need to give like five, at, at this after 26 months, uh, we'll have like five five samples of the ventilator to test to validate in already in the hospitals, which uh, even initial initial tests uh, we would think it will be they will be passed. And also we prepare, uh, let's say, uh, manufacturing documents according to the standards. To, so it could be uh, manu easy, easily manufacturable um, by, by not, not by only our manufacturing facility, but when if it needed, when the, let's say, resources, when the power of the manufacturing of one company, even it is big, is not enough, so others could could manufacture according to the same standard documents. So at the same time, to expedite everything, we um, uh, we were talking with uh, um, so with the NASA JPL uh, and the Jet Propulsion uh, Laboratories. Uh, so they they mentioned that they have like uh, uh, they they have designed some minimum viable ventilator. And um, uh, so we discussed with them uh, the possibility to leverage some, uh, some of the, uh, let's say, portions to, to look at the documentation, to, uh, let's say, share the experience, uh, although we have like our technical requirements. Um, and then uh, among uh, this uh, 90 C, uh, 96 proposals uh, which were submitted, uh, 24 got a license. And we are uh, like, that. There, there was an investigation, there was an interview, there was a, like uh, evaluation of the company cap capabilities and uh, so on and so forth. And we're, we're, we've been selected uh, the only from, from Armenia as a, as a company that can, uh, it has a competency to uh, design and manufacture the ventilators. So we got the license. Um, this is it, this is it from my side, thank you. So I'll be happy to, to answer to your questions. Uh, before, uh, can I just add something here if uh, I may? Uh, I just wanted to, again, uh, express appreciation to the whole team, uh, especially the Armenian engineers and scientists of America, uh, Shant, uh, who's I think on the call as well, uh, uh, Baron Havanes, and everybody who has uh, really uh, provided a lot of the support that uh, was needed to go beyond. And so again, uh, thank you very much for all the support.
Larry, you're muted. Uh, first, congratulations. This is really amazing how you can start at food meaning you had no experience or knowledge of respirators and uh, within 26 weeks you'll have five products ready for validation. Um, so congratulations and, and to the whole team. It's really amazing. Uh, I, I had some doubts when I heard the first phone call um, and the lack of the clinical knowledge, but uh, Shant and Rafi and others uh, really, I mean, our Armenian engineers did a great job uh, bringing this project along. Um, how long is the validation project, and um, how much, how many ventilators do you foresee making? Um, is this going to be a sustainable business moving forward after this pandemic? Everything depends on, on how the situation with COVID pandemic will will evolve. Like again, but uh, we will rely on a doctor's opinion. If the doctor will say yes this is enough like you have like uh, when when they when we will have a feedback and we'll correct everything all the i i hope like minor uh some some uh, remarks and uh when the doctor will say okay i'm ready i can now connect this to my patient that that will be the best i think um uh, again, we are in a contact with uh, with lots of uh, doctors, with with the biomedical engineers, and we are trying to make it as usable uh, as it is it is possible. But again, the end end world will be behind the doctor. Uh, if I may add as well, I think one of the main things that uh, from the very beginning that we uh, we all worked on was to ensure the minimal viable product that can be used immediately. I mean, that's one of the, the advices that the specialists, the medical experts were giving us. So the design, the, the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong again, but again, the design is meant to be very modular. So immediately if uh, to be used and there and thereafter, if uh, go yep. beyond as needed. So it, the whole point is to make it to uh, as a reaction to the COVID-19, uh, but uh, allow it to go beyond as needed, basically. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, uh, the, so this is this is basically the long term, long term our target, you know, so uh, our, uh, so now, you know, Armenia is in a war currently in a, in a situation in a non stable situation because of our neighbors. So uh, it's, it's right now, this is for the COVID-19, but as Marina mentioned, so it's, it's modular and can be uh, evolved, uh, like the features can be added upon like the requirements. Um, and uh, like, it's like the target, uh, our aim is a long term. To use in in other uh, in other in other situations if it is needed, but a short term uh, target is a COVID-19. For the manufacturing part, it's uh, I think uh, again the, uh, as I mentioned, like the construction, all these manufacturing papers will be available. It's a parallel uh, work, so. If, if our uh, manufacturing facility power is not enough, other manufacturing facilities could manufacture this. Uh, I, I do not, I am not ready to answer like uh, how many pieces exactly per day we will be able to manufacture, but we have a, if, if, if we uh, make this, if we evolve this uh, up to just uh, assembly and uh, validation, uh, assembly and test, um, uh, stage so manufacturing could assemble and test and validate using this uh, lung simulator. Uh, so it could be um, it could be tense per day, I think. As we cooperative effort uh, between uh, the engineering city, the group, and uh, the United States engineers, uh, Armenian engineers and scientists here, East Coast as well as West Coast. And we try to find all the resources that they can launch this project, uh, you know, successfully, which I'm happy. And first of all, I, I would like to congratulate that they came through fast with their uh, initial design and JPL approved it, which is uh, amazing. 
and came to 24 out of uh, what 300 applicants. <laughs> That's great. And there really wasn't that much competition in the area. The only other regional award winner was Turkey. Right, that, that's correct. So in terms of regional, it's a competition. In terms of internal Armenia, it's not a competition. I mean, it's a call for action. Right. Yeah. Uh, and again, if you produce this uh, uh, long-term objective uh, to sell to the neighboring countries, do you have a license to uh, manufacture and sell them with profit, of course. Um, so the design is ours. Like, uh, you, you, which which one you mean? The I think we're talking yeah. about J yeah, JPL. The, the, the JPL license, I believe, right? Uh, Vigen gives you the uh, the license also to come. The main light portion is to commercially sell this. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, our like uh, the 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 one that uh, I don't know the end end product uh, currently will, will be uh, uh, much uh, will, will be based much on our design or JPL. I think because we had uh, lots of discussions with the doctors who are the end users of this ventilator, um, and uh, but I think like the long term, very long term plans. Saying very long term, maybe. Um, year or two is to license it for selling the first first market is uh, EAC Eurasian uh, this economic union uh, where it's easy to get in to this market and then uh, like uh, of course like uh, 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 the 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 very let's say the best best scenario is to have a FDA FDA approval for for a, a of the shelf ventilator. It will be the best best scenario. Well, uh, you might need uh, to patent patent it. Your design. Mm. Yeah, this I think this is one of the uh, things that we did, we uh, we're working with uh, in I engineering the next steps basically. So I think right now that everybody is so involved in the technical details and making sure it, uh, and. Uh, expediting the whole process. Uh, uh, so I think uh, you're, you're absolutely right. We, they, they need to have the, uh, to think of the next steps and the next steps. Uh, right now, I think the urgency of uh, looking at every, this, looking at the design to manufacturing and ensuring the timely delivery of a uh, productized version. I think that's the focus right now. Great. Are there any other comments? I know as um, I'm getting text messages, one of them was go Armenia. Yes, we're so proud of you. Uh, and that goes for Robin the robot as well. Uh, really remarkable, uh, all the development in the technology sector now interacting with the medical sector uh, to respond to this crisis. Um, and hopefully propel Armenia uh, as we move forward in the manufacturing sector. So uh, all really terrific, very exciting news. Thank you very much for joining us uh, from very the wee hours of the morning in Armenia. We appreciate it very much. Uh, this goes for, you're very welcome. And for Kadin and for Vegan and Marina, uh, as your uh, progress uh, moves forward. If you ever feel the need to share more information with us, we would be love to have you on and hear about all the new exciting developments for each of your companies. So great work. There's some interesting research that has been coming out by looking at wastewater. Uh, the initial studies came out of uh, Italy uh, and when they retrospectively went back and reanalyzed water, they actually, the wastewater uh, they found uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, in there and about two months before the first cases happened in Italy. Uh, these studies have been done in waste facilities around the world and 
it looks like um, this might be a way to measure community spread before there actually is disease or gauge the degree. Um, is there any work like that going on in our you know, heard of any studies like that that actually have clinical application or is it too premature without all the evidence in? I believe um, Vikan, Dr. Vikan Sipelian is on the phone. Uh, Vikan, I know you've been involved uh, in a lot of the uh, work uh, orchestrating care uh, in Armenia. Uh, are there any comments that you would like to make about the ongoing efforts to assist Armenia? Yeah, thank you, Larry, uh, and really excellent presentations. And I'd like to congratulate um, both presenters for all the great work that uh, you're doing and your companies are doing in the healthcare tech uh, sectors. Larry, I'll be very quick. First of all, to the point of, uh, uh, of the wastewater, there are uh, some universities here on the West Coast. Uh, I believe Berkeley may be one of them, but don't, don't quote me on that, um, that are indeed uh, doing those types of wastewater analyses on the dormitories of the students that are, um, that are still being housed on campus. And there are some interesting analysis apparently that, that I heard that will will be published soon. Uh, in regards to Armenia, um, we are continuing to respond to whatever Armenia needs and uh, as well as trying to think ahead. Uh, the latest ask had been uh, in terms of any um, uh, specialists that can travel to Armenia. And as, all, as many of you know, there have been several teams of uh, intensive care specialists that have traveled to Armenia. Um, there's a uh, team from France that, that arrived in Yerevan yesterday. I'm not sure if this was discussed already. I joined a little late, my apologies. But um, that team now is transitioning over uh, the first team from France that arrived. This second team is, is led by a renowned um, intensivist uh, doc, uh, professor Laurent Papazian. Um, there's also been teams that have arrived from uh, Lithuania, um, from Russia, and we are we have been working hard to see, uh, you know, what we can do from the United States. And as you mentioned, you know, we are in in the. It seems like our cases are going up and. And it, it is probably unrealistic to have teams go from here. However, we have identified a team of physicians from Lebanon that may be uh, re 